So our next speaker is Jonathan Hazelhurst, who's going to talk, who's from the University of Birmingham. He's an academic clinical lecturer. He's going to talk about obstructive sleep apnea, so hopefully not something we'll experience during your talk. Um, and it's association with activation of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. I'll let you read the rest of your title. Thank you very much indeed. It's, a, it's too long a title for a talk, so I've boiled it down to what matters. So my name is John Hazelhurst, and I'm going to present to you some data that I've obtained across my Wellcome Trust funded clinical research training fellowship um, at the University of Oxford. I, I'm now newly based at the University of Birmingham. And just before I start, thank you so much for the opportunity to present today. Um, it's a real privilege. Um, let me just introduce obstructive sleep apnea. And you've already stolen my opening joke. So it's, uh, it's characterized by, by complete or partial upper airway obstruction. And this occurs during sleep. And it typically results in intermittent hypoxia. Now, two of my experimental models I'm going to talk to you about are of intermittent hypoxia. And a caveat, that is only one part of obstructive sleep apnea. Now, the main treatment for OSA is weight loss and uh, continuous positive airway pressure therapy, which is very poorly tolerated and pictured here. Now, we all know, hopefully, that obstructive sleep apnea is associated with cardiovascular risk uh, and, unfortunately, death, but it's also associated with my other disease of interest, and that's non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And we know from large meta-analysis that the presence and severity of OSA goes hand in hand with the presence and severity of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And if I can't convince you of that, then also even lean people with obstructive sleep apnea, there's certainly a significant increased risk of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So, the process by which lipid accumulates within the liver occurs via multiple pathways, but for simplicity and time, I'm just going to talk to you today about de novo lipogenesis. Now, de novo lipogenesis is the process by which newly synthesized lipid um, is uh, derived from carbohydrate precursor. And we can measure that using a stable isotope deuterated water, which is incorporated into newly synthesized lipid at different points um, in its synthesis. And then we can quantify that using mass spec in different lipid fractions. And this really leads me on to one of my first hypotheses, and that's to look at whether intermittent hypoxia could cause fatty liver disease through um, driving increased de novo lipogenesis, increased synthesis of new lipid. And the second thing I'm interested in is a lot of the uh, metabolic complications with it we see in obstructive sleep apnea are very similar to what we see in conditions of steroid excess like Cushing's. And we started to wonder whether some of the metabolic consequence of obstructive sleep apnea might be via effects on steroid action or steroid signaling. And my second hypothesis is that obstructive sleep apnea activates steroid signaling. Uh, and naturally, following on from that, I questioned whether by blocking the steroid receptor, we could pre perhaps protect against the risk of fatty liver disease in, in, in those with obstructive sleep apnea. And in my, in my rodent study, two weeks of intermittent hypoxia um, was sufficient to not only cause changes in key genes of de novo lipogenesis, here pictured as ACC1 and fatty acid synthase, but more importantly, also has a direct functional Im impact on de novo lipogenesis uh, measured here with deuterated water. So at least in my rat model, intermittent hypoxia looks to increase de novo lipogenesis. But, but what about in man? So this is a, my human study, which is very similar design to, to the rodent study, but is a much more acute intermittent hypo hypoxia protocol. And again, we looked at de novo lipogenesis, clearly lots of other indices as well, but I'm just going to talk to you about this one today. And this is a healthy volunteer study. And the intermittent hypoxia was very well tolerated. We did this by a normal mask, as you'd see on an NHS ward, and we were able to reliably and re reproducibly desaturate patients' ox participants' oxygen levels down uh, multiple times across the hour to model OSA. And again, as with our rodents, we saw um, consistent increases in de novo lipogenesis here measured in the liver-specific VLDL lipid fraction in both the fasted state after prolonged exposure to hypoxia and also in a hyperinsulinemic state as well. So it looks like our human data certainly marries up with my rodent data, and that intermittent hypoxia does indeed increase de novo lipogenesis, at least in, in my experimental models. So looking again at obstructive sleep apnea, and these are patients who have already, we've, we've been proven that they are compliant with their CPAP therapy. In this study, they were then randomized to either continue their CPAP or have sham CPAP treatment done with essentially holes in, in, in the circuitry and subtherapeutic pressures. And those who had sham CPAP um, have elevated glucocorticoid metabolites. And we measure this in a nocturnal urine collection, uh, looking at GCMS uh, urinary steroid profiles. Um, so it's not a difficult to jump to think that obstructive sleep apnea 
activates the HPA access, although this was a CPAP withdrawal model. So following on to that, we took this into our human study again, and we looked to antagonize the glucocorticoid receptor with a steroid receptor, RU486. And unfortunately, we saw no metabolic protection whatsoever. So, by way of conclusion, intermittent hypoxia does indeed drive de novo lipogenesis, and even though steroid levels are increased in patients with obstructive sleep apnea, when we took this back into our human experimental model and tried blocking that receptor, we saw no metabolic protection whatsoever. So thank you very much to all my collaborators and my funded Wellcome Trust, and most importantly, the participants. Thank you.